Hey, this is Rachel Zufa, and welcome to our very first book talk. We're going to be discussing the 2020 William C. Morris Award finalists. Um, the Morris Award is a newer award for the American Library Association, and it is named after William C. Morris, who is a very well-known publisher that pushed for diversity amongst young adult literature. And these books are all published by debut authors, so it's the very first time they published a book, and it happens to be for young adults. So these are the top five debut books um, for young adults that were selected by a committee, and they were deemed to be the very best that were published in, from October 2018 to October 2019. Um, and so we have three contemporary books and two fantasy books. So first I'm going to start off with the fantasy books. And the first one is The Candle and the Flame by Nafisa Azad. And this is a really great standalone epic fantasy. And I fell in love with it. If you are a fantasy reader, and I am, uh, most fantasies tend to pull from Anglo-Saxon Celtic mythology. And this, whoo, nothing to it. It does not do that. Um, you are not going to find a white person in this book because it takes place in what is known as the Oriental Silk Road. And it is taking place in a part of Asia and it, that you're not going to be seeing white people. So this is fantastic. We finally have a fantasy book for people of color who are not used to seeing themselves. So that was exciting for me. But that's not the real thing. The real thing's the story, right? We talk about what is the story. So here's what I love about the story. Um, we have here a Muslim protagonist. Her name is Fatima. And Fatima, in the introduction of this book, is a baby. She's a baby. Not much to babies. They're kind of boring, but not this child. So she's traveling with her family in a caravan. And you have to understand that the mythology is based on Islamic and Arabic folklore. And so we are dealing with jinn. Now, for those of us who are Westerners, we might know jinn as genies. So there are different kinds of jinn. So we have ifrit, and ifrit are jinn who believe in organization, who believe in taking chaos and making things clear okay so we might call these the OCD gen and then we have those that are called the shayateen and the shayateen are those who believe in chaos they love to just stir that up you know people who want to like spill the tea constantly this is what you got okay but it's a little bit more than that they thrive on bloodshed now for the most part jinn live on a different plane than we do okay they live on a different plane um, and so we don't normally see them, but they can come down to our plane. And so the shiny team loves to come down to our plane and they like to mess things up. Okay. And the Efreet love to come and straighten things out. And so what we have here is baby Fatima with her family and they are traveling and you bet the shiny team come and they mess it up. They mess it up, right? So we got bloodshed happening. Now we have an Efreet, and I don't want to give away too much about Gazala, okay? Because this, you know, I want you to read this book. But she comes along, and she hears the cries of a baby. And for her backstory, this is urgent. And she goes in to save. By the time she gets there, baby Fatima is already seriously injured. So what does she do? She ends up bringing her to the city of Noor. And Noor, by the way, means light in Arabic. And she brings her to this place, this city that is housing all these refugees from all over different countries and places um, in Asia. And she gives up her own life. She takes the blood, the fire that lives within the jinn, and she puts it into Fatima in order that she might live. So now, Fatima is more than just a human child. So by the time the locals from Noor come and rush because they hear the child crying, Ghazala 
is no more? I'll let you find out. But what she they see is baby Fatima with an oud, musical instrument that Ghazala always carried with her, covered in blood and with a sword. Now here is the thing. The city of Noor is constantly at war. Now they may house people from all over practicing different religions. Um, Muslim. Uh, there, there is Muslim people who are practicing Islam. There are people who are practiced who are Buddhist. There are people who are Hindi. And yet they have drawn together, speaking different languages, practicing different cultures and, and harmony because their true enemy is the Shayateen. And so they all come together. Yet, what is it that's going to be able to help defeat the Shayateen? Fatima. Fatima is going to be key. Read the candle and the flame and find out what it means to be a young woman, a young Muslim woman, in a culture, in a human culture, that is patriarchal. And to have a voice. So, that is the first one. And the next one that I'm excited to share with you that is fantasy, ooh, 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 I got some glare, is There Will Come a Darkness by Katie Rose Poole. Check that out. Isn't that sweet? And the second book is coming out this August, so stay tuned for it. It's going to be a trilogy, okay? So this is not a standalone. This is also another epic fantasy. And this is a quest. How many of you like quests? Now, we're talking like... Lord of the Rings type quest, okay? Get ready for it. Now, what I loved about this book too is that it is told in alternating perspectives. So you get to find out what other people are doing and what is going on at different moments during the book. So it's told from five different point of views, okay? And in this world, okay, you have individuals who have different graces. That is what it's called. Now, I want you to kind of compare the graces. And I'm sorry, Katie, if I got this wrong, but this I have to do analogies. But the graces are kind of like a mutant power. Let's think about it. Like I'm thinking X-Men, okay? So that means they got a little bit of mm, genes. Like they got a little bit of extra oomph in their genes, okay? So there are different graces okay there's four different graces you got the grace of the heart which means you got like extra physical attributes okay like man you are like bruce lee on steroids but it's like everything comes together within your body okay so one of our characters who is telling our story okay jude he has the grace of heart um, you have the grace of blood. Now that sounds kind of like, ooh, gruesome, are you a vampire? No, you're not. So the grace of blood means that you have the power to heal, but it can also be used um, in a negative way. And we're going to be talking about how it can be the grace of harm. And so one of ours, Ephira, one of our other point of views, Ephira has the grace of blood, and boy, is it powerful. Okay, and in fact, all of our characters that have a grace are very powerful characters. Um, we also have the grace of mind, and the grace of mind is the ability to create. Um, you're able to just like kind of create things almost out of nothing. You're brilliant. You can be an alchemist, um, almost think like engineering type things, and you can just think of the most um, radical, coolest, logical things. Okay. Um, none of our characters have a point of view of the grace of mind, okay? But we do see characters that have this grace. And the last is the grace of sight. And this is one of the most rare graces. Um, and it's considered in most ways to be sort of a, a, a small grace, except for one of the characters whose point of view we follow, which is Anton. Now, the grace of sight is usually like to locate things. Like, wouldn't that be great? You lose your keys. God, where did I lose my keys? Oh, I got the grace of sight is right there. But it's more than that. It also is the power to be able to see into the future of prophecy. But no one has had this grace of sight for a long time. Okay? And let me tell you why. Because at one point, there used to be seven prophets. And the seven prophets foretold what was going to happen. And so for a long time, people in this world knew this is what is going to happen in our world. But at one point, a hundred years before, they all died out. They left. No more prophets. But the last thing that they predicted, you got it. There's going to come a darkness. 
okay and so there is one last prophecy which is hidden and it's hidden by a group that Jude is a part of and their goal is that they know there's going to be one last prophet that's going to arise I'm not gonna say who but one of these people that is telling the story is going to be one of the last prophets and so they will see what is going to bring about this darkness and if they're able to stop it so let's bring on the other characters so the other point of views that you get to see is Prince Hassan. Prince Hassan Prince Hassan does not have any grace okay but he is the ruler of a kingdom that has now been overcome by a person who believes all grace should be destroyed and he has created this fire okay this fire where if you put people in it now let's be honest you're gonna put people in a fire you're gonna kill them right but if they go through this fire and they survive the fire it burns out their grace and now let's try I'm gonna try and like and, and give you a feeling of what that's like burning out someone's grace in this book is like taking away their soul okay grace is a part of who they are so if you are burning out their grace you are taking away a vital part of who they are so it isn't just like oh man I don't have my power to find my keys anymore it's like you have destroyed who they are and for many of them they don't survive okay how do you survive without a soul so this is very serious and he has a cult following so they've taken over Prince Hassan's kingdom and he is in exile so we get to have his point of view as well so the other person we get to hear about is Beru and Beru is the sister of Afira and I don't want to give too much away about her because it's just there's just too much going on but Afira is not necessarily using her power to heal she's also using it to harm but she feels like she's got a good reason to do so all right so I don't want to give away too much here's the deal they are all in some way shape or form mentioned in the final prophecy the one that Jude has so all of them at some point are going to make or break the world so you are going to go on a journey what is it going to be now they're not all perfect people thank God for that because who wants to hear about perfection one of them's a gambler one of them a lot of them don't want to take on the burden and all of them bear a label about who they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do and most of them are like hey man just because the prophecy says I'm supposed to do this doesn't mean I want to do this and I think that happens to a lot of us in life where we're told we're supposed to do something which we don't necessarily feel is our job and what can they really do five people against what seems to be an encroaching darkness that will not stop find out find out and when you read this you're going you're not going to be able to wait until August there will come a darkness all right now this book Genesis begins again now you can tell ooh, ooh, I got too much shine on it here we go this is by Alicia D Williams now this book got so many stickers on it that if I actually had the ones with the stickers you'd barely be able to see Genesis face so in addition to the Morris it also won a Newberry Honor Medal and it also won the John Steptoe um, award for uh, which is a part of the Coretta Scott King family um, for best african-american debut author and just want to give props to the book and the author where it's deserved and this is a fantastic book I just I have to tell that I have to say straight up and I it's an african-american protagonist but I'm one of those people who feel that even if even though it's dealing with the ideas of colorism and race and what it feels to be black I'm a white woman there were things in here I could identify with and Genesis for those of you who don't know Genesis is the first book of the Bible and the word Genesis actually means the beginning so if you take her name Genesis begins again the beginning begins again and one of the things I hope that you can take away from this idea is the thought that as people our stories can always begin again that anyone who ever tells you you're stuck and this is where you're gonna be forget them 
you can always start again. And this is one of the ideas that Alicia carries through in her book. Now, young Genesis is in middle school. She's living in Detroit. Um, her father is dark skinned, as is she and her mother is light-skinned. And the reason I mention this is it plays a big role in what is going on in Genesis life. So Genesis is not just dealing with what is going on as far as colorism, okay? She's living in poverty. Her mother works really hard. Her mom is a CNA. She helps out um, in, as far as housekeeping and, and cleaning um, at a nursing home. Her father, for the most part, can't keep down a job, okay? And um, he is an alcoholic. He is a gambler, um, takes money out of her mother's wallet so that he can use it to either buy alcohol or go and try and bet. And this is just Genesis life. And, you know, for, for many of us who um, have grown up in such homes or are living in such a life, um, you don't realize that there's anything else but this because this is who you are. And so Genesis attends public schools within Detroit and um, has a hard time connecting and making friends. And one day, for example, she comes across a list. hundred things we hate about Genesis. All right. And what Genesis ends up doing is she keeps adding to this list of the things that she hates about herself. And one of them is how dark she is. And I'm not going to get into too much detail because I want you to read about the book. Read the book and find out. One of them is, is that she is so dark. Now, her daddy herself, himself has told her this. Um, well, you were supposed to come out looking like your mama not me. Hmm. You be pretty, but now for those of us who are women or maybe even us, even those of you who are young men, you may have been told you'd be smart, but you'd be pretty, but you know, and for her is you'd be pretty, but you're so dark. Okay. And Throughout Genesis' journey in this book, um, she tries different ways to make herself more light-skinned. And there are different stereotypes and judgments that go along with what it means to be black. And this isn't just a, a night, you know, 2019, 2020 thing. This is an idea that's been around for a long time. And you get this when you meet Genesis grandmother, who is light skinned, that you're supposed to be marrying up. And by marrying up, you're marrying someone who's light. And her mother didn't do that. But you also find out that there's trauma in her parents past. There's trauma in her dad's past about why he feels the way that he feels. And what do you do? And how do you move forward? And <clears throat> how do you make connections with people when you yourself are struggling with who you are? What I love about Genesis is that she ends up finding connections. So don't feel, don't, don't get, don't get too upset. Don't, don't even ignore this book because you think there's no hope. Genesis offers hope. Remember what I said? Your story can always begin again. And there is hope in this book. Read about it. And if you, as a white person, like me, don't understand what it means to live with something like this, pick it up. And it isn't just about what it means to be black and colorism. It's also about what it means to be a family. And I think that's something all of us can relate to. The Genesis begins again. So the next book I'd like to talk about is Frankly in Love by David Yoon. Oh, I got to move it over. I'm getting used to this. All right. So, Frankly in Love. Now, first of all, I got to tell you that Frank Lee is a pun because his name, or protagonist's name, is Frank Lee. And his white American girlfriend thinks Frank Lee together is cute. It's like, like little pun, right? So, Frank Lee. Um, and so that's how we get Frank Lee in Love, okay? Now, let's just stop right there because Frank Lee is Korean American. Okay, let's not forget that hyphen. He's Korean hyphen American. And uh, skirt, I mentioned he has a 
European American, that is what Brit, his girlfriend, calls herself. So she is white. Here lies the rom-com problem, okay? His family emphasizes Korean and the Korean American, whereas Frank has always been in the American culture. And so he doesn't speak Korean. He doesn't know how to do any kind of Korean cooking. You know, he eats Korean, but he doesn't really necessarily know what goes into it. Um, yet, when people look at him, they see, they ask, well, what are you? Right? Because you're not like, look at me, right? No one's asking what I am, right? But they see him and they see something that's other than, okay? So his parents came from Korea and he is first generation and they have certain expectations for him. You will go to the Harvard, you will get the best SAT scores, you will always get straight A's and you will only date and marry a nice Korean girl. Well, that kind of goes out with uh, the dishwater when he ends up falling in love with Brit, who is not Korean. Problem. Now, unless you think that Frank's parents aren't real about this, their daughter, okay, Frank's older sister, ended up falling in love with a black man, marrying him, and she was disowned by the family. So Frank knows they mean it. What to do, what to do. Well, now his friend Joy, and they're kind of a weird sort of friend group, okay? They call them, they, they, uh, they all are together because of families, the, the, Korean, the Koreans who came over to America together um, as, as a group uh, to start a life there for their kids. Uh, they do gatherings every month, okay? And so the kids all have to come together and, you know, for forced family time, okay? We all know forced family time. Whatever it is you have to do, you have a forced family time. So, Joy is dating someone who's Chinese-American. So, they come up with a plan. Hey, let's swap. Let's pretend we're dating and then we'll swap our dates, okay? So, Frank's like, I'll pick you up. Everybody will be happy because we're dating each other. But really, you're going to go out with your dude. I'm going to go out with my girl. We're set. And this seems to work okay right? But y'all know it's going to be a disaster, right? Y'all know it's going to be a disaster. But beyond being this romantic comedy disaster, we have more things at play, okay? Because we also have those things that you hide within your family that you don't really want other people to know. What does it mean when we talk about race? What does that mean? Um... David Yoon is pretty wide open when he talks about it. He talks about how this takes place, by the way, in um, in Orange County, a fictional Orange County, okay, um, with no real names put in there, all right? But he talks about driving from, like, one, one city that is, you know, more Mexican, one that is more, you know, Chinese, one that's Korean, and so forth, so they get to their house. And the comments that his dad and mom will make, against other races and how how much it bothers him how he'll come right out and say you guys are so racist and how his parents be like no not racist just joking and I think that as a teenager and maybe even when you're an adult and you're with your family and you hear comments that make you feel uncomfortable because it's a generation gap um it could be a whole cultural gap you have those moments where you're like, hey, I gotta speak up, I gotta say something, but how much are you able to say? So there's a lot in here to digest, not just about like a great romance and, and some, some comedic moments, but also about what it means to be real with your family and how do you accept that? Um, how do you continue to love and, and work through that complicated relationship with, with people that you care about um, when they hold ideals that are so different from your own? Um, Frankly in Love, a really excellent book about the complications that we have within our families and in other relationships. So the last book I had to share for you, um, which is the winner for the Morris, all of those were finalists, 
All of them are winners, but this is the actual one with the sticker on it, though I don't have a sticker on mine, is The Field Guide of a North American Teenager by Ben Philippe. Um, and it's already out in paperback, and um, all of these authors I should mention are currently writing other books, so be on the lookout for their new stuff too. And this is a really fascinating book because I feel like a lot of the books in the Morris for the Morris year um, for 2020 all have to do with labels and language in some way, shape, or form. And this book really epitomizes that. So what we have here is Norris. I love Norris. You know why? Norris is snarky. Um, he whines. He complains. He reminds me a little bit of myself. Uh, I'd like to say as a teenager, but kind of now too. Um, Norris is from Montreal. He is a black French Canadian who loves to play hockey. All right. Um, his parents are Haitian. And if you think it already, he already sticks out because he's a black French Canadian, he would tell you yes. But guess what happens? Now his parents are split up and now his mom is able to get a job um, at a university. And it's very difficult for um, the, the line of work that she's in to find a, an actual professorship. But she gets one in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas, how many hockey teams do you think are going to be down there for high schoolers? Zero, zero, okay? So here you have a black French Canadian kid who loves hockey moving to Austin, Texas. Guess what, it's freaking hot. It's the first thing Norris notices when he gets down there. It's one of my favorite lines from the whole book is he gets down there and he's just like, and, and he talks about how both him and his mother sweat profusely. And he talks about, oh my God, who, who decided, who decided that this would be a good place to live? It is so hot. It is so hot. Now this would honestly be me whining. Okay. And he's already irritated because nobody recognizes, um, the Hobbs, which is his favorite Canadian team. Okay. Um, hockey team, I should say. And everyone keeps looking at him like, what is that? What is What's that? And I got to be honest, as someone who lives in Wisconsin, that's transplanted from California, if I wear something that nobody recognized from California, I feel annoyed as well. So he's feeling doubly annoyed. He's hot and nobody recognizes his favorite hockey team. So he steps outside. He's met with this blast of heat in the summer. And he's asking his mom, my God, who decides that this is a good place? And his mom's like, like just, be, just be quiet. Don't draw attention to yourself. But he's already on his phone and he's looking up and he's like, Stephen Fuller Austin, you know, he's the one who decided that going ahead and making like a place to live, like right, like on like on the surface of the sun was a good idea, mom, you know, and of course he's loud and he's obnoxious and it's hysterical because let's be honest, he's saying aloud all the things that some of us wish we would say out loud without caring what other people think. This is Norris. Right from the beginning, you get Norris in your face, just like this, right here. Yep, just like this. And he doesn't change. Or does he? Read the book. But what Norris ends up doing, and that's why it's called a field guide, is right when he gets to high school, the guidance counselor, who assumes he doesn't know English, and so has forms filled out for, like, you know, a French translator and everything else, Norris is real thrilled about this as well, hands him a little notebook and says, well, this is for you to, you know, record how you feel and everything else. And Norris is kind of like, I'm so tired of this crap. But he takes it and he ends up recording, writing down what he sees of the people in his high school. Now, keep in mind, everything Norris thinks about high schools in the United States is based upon what he has seen in movies. So we're talking The Breakfast Club, we're talking, you know, all the John Hughes movies, okay? So we're talking anything on TV, anything in the movies, this is what he imagines U.S. high schools to be like, okay? So he assumes there's groups. You got the jocks, okay? And so, uh, like on the book jacket here, he goes, oh, identifying characteristics. They're muscular and rarely spotted without a water bottle. Okay. Um, and you got the beta cheerleaders and you got the loners, you know. So he starts marking down 
what he thinks of the different people there. And he puts them into different groups. And this is how he amuses himself. And he is determined not to become attached to anyone. All right, you see the plot, right? He's going to get attached, right? And it's going to come about in the most unlikely of ways. But before he gets attached, he's going to learn a few things about himself. And it's not always pretty. Um, when you tend to keep your distance, and right now social distance, right? You end up finding a few things about yourself that maybe aren't the most flattering or the most kind. Um, and when you ascribe labels to people, you realize that those labels don't always apply. Um, it's kind of like when I used to tell blonde jokes to my friend that was blonde, she would say, can you stop? Um, it may seem fun when you're doing it, but at the same time, maybe it's not. And so the field guide to the North American teenager is about what it feels like to be out of water, to be uncomfortable. And sometimes it feels easier to fall back on those labels, right? Um, it feels easier to just keep your distance. Um, because if you keep your distance, you don't get hurt. Um, but how long can you keep that distance? And how often do those labels really apply? And if you start labeling other people, you might be surprised how they end up labeling you. So, Ben Philippe's The Field Guide to the North American Teenager. I hope that one of these Morris finalists and winner um, sound interesting to you. And keep in mind, all of them are just really great stories about different characters, different places in the world, and some worlds that are made up. And remember, your story is very important. And if you don't feel like you can tell your own story yet, then I hope you can find a story that makes sense to you. Until then, enjoy your story.